on June 30th, 2001, I was there. This was not only the most dramatic Arena Football League game I attended, but one of the most memorable sporting events I've been to. If you looked at the records of these two teams going into this game, one would reason that it shouldn't have gone down like this. The Florida Bobcats were a below average franchise with consistently abysmal attendance figures in their history, averaging just over 2,300 fans per game in their final season. In that same season, they set the lowest attendance in league history with 1,154 fans in a home game against the Los Angeles Avengers, and they won that game. Their best season in getting people out to see this team was just over 5,100 fans per game in 1999. Their previous namesakes and locations drew more fan interest than this floundering team who had called West Palm Beach and Sunrise, Florida their home. Their previous name, the Miami Hooters, <laughs> Hooters. The Hooters were even worse, boasting a 1-11 record in 1995 under head coach, former New Orleans Saints quarterback John Forcade. However, despite making the playoffs once in 1993, they had better attendance figures than the Florida Bobcats ever did. They drew a little over 6,100 fans per game in their horrid 1995 season. Even their original name, the Sacramento Attack in 1992, had better attendance in their lone season in the capital of California, drawing an average of 7,200 fans fans per game and even making the playoffs despite having a losing record. This was the norm for fledgling teams in this league. This was a niche league and continues to be a niche league. To many of the players, this either was still their way of life or a second job to them. The Bobcats were 4-6 and six heading into this game. The Sabercats were having another solid season after being eliminated in the semifinals in the 2000 season. They were 8-2 and two going into this game. Wins included a thriller in overtime against the Nashville Cats, the team that derailed the Sabercats Arena Bowl dreams the year before, and denied me a chance to see a championship game in person. Also, a win at home against the Oklahoma Wrangler, 73-17. It would go down to be the largest margin of victory for the Sabercats at home at 56 points. I was keeping track of the AFL that season, and I had a feeling that the Florida Bobcats would be a cakewalk for this team. But in the words of Chris Berman when he did NFL Primetime, that is why they play the games. Starting for the Sabercats was the, you could call him the Troy Aikman of the franchise. Franchise, Mark Grebe. Before joining the Sabercats in 1999, Grebe played in NFL Europe for the Scottish Claymores. Also, in between the great season in 2000 and midway through the 2001 AFL season, Grebe was an emergency starter for the Las Vegas Outlaws of the XFL. With the exception of 1997 and 1999, Grebe threw for at least 2,000 yards in each year of his AFL career. For the Florida Bobcats, Ricky Fogey. Before joining the Bobcats, he spent four seasons with the New Jersey Red Dogs. Fogey was starting quarterback for the first three seasons in New Jersey. In his last season with the Red Dogs, Fogey backed up a familiar face to Yenzers all through Pittsburgh, Tommy Maddox. Maddox would go on to play a season in the XFL and finished out his pro football career spending five seasons with the Pittsburgh Steelers, winning a Super Bowl in 2005. In the first quarter, Barry Wagner got the party started with the one-yard touchdown run. PAT by Jason Wells missed. Bobcats would take advantage of the missed PAT by Wells when Kevin McKenzie caught a 19-yard pass from Fogey. Near the end of the first quarter, the Bobcats would add to the lead when Curtis James caught a 5-yard pass from Fogey. In the game, the Sabercats turned the ball over twice on fumbles. I'd like to say that the second quarter would be the moment that Florida took control of the game. The Bobcats would take advantage of the Sabercat turnovers and pad the lead even further. Curtis Caesar caught a 12-yard pass from Fogey. Bernard Holmes caught a long 29-yard pass from Fogey. With less than 30 seconds left in the first half, the Sabercats finally had an answer. James Hunden would catch a 16-yard pass from Grebe. Wagner would run it in for a two-point conversion. In the third quarter, the Sabercats' defense helped them get back into the game, including three interceptions thrown by Fogey. In the third quarter, Grebe would throw a long 29-yard pass to Hunden to get within seven. With less than a minute left in the third, Joey Dozier would run half the field for 24 yards and into the end zone, tying the game at 28. I remember losing my mind after Dozier scored. I went insane screaming, THEY CAUGHT UP! THEY CAUGHT UP! The fourth quarter was when the action was the epitome of a hard-nosed back-and-forth arena football game. A team that would become an arena bowl contender in a heavyweight fight against a mediocre team that couldn't get anyone to see them play. No matter what the Bobcats would do, the Sabercats had an answer. 
Holmes caught a 14-yard pass from Fogey. Cats would tie it up when Jerry Reese caught a 35-yard TD pass from Greeb. The Bobcats answer when McKenzie caught a 26-yard pass from Fogey. Sabercats counterattacked when Barry Wagner caught a 9-yard pass from Greeb. Once again, Fogey would find McKenzie in the end zone with a 4-yard pass. With 8 seconds left, the Sabercats would tie the game. Greeb with a 9-yard pass to James Hunden. We were going to overtime. This would be the only AFL game I went to that needed overtime. For those who are curious on how OT worked in the Arena Football League, it was a mixture of college rules and the 2000s era NFL OT rules. Each team would have the ball at least once. If the score was tied after each possession, the next team to score would be the winner. If the game was still level after the period, the game would be called a tie, which has only happened three times in the league as of recording this. In 1988, 2005, and 2015, except the last instance was because the Las Vegas Outlaws and the New Orleans Voodoo were so financially inept that the league took over both teams, canceled the game where both teams were scheduled to play each other, and declared their game a 1-1 tie. In fact, the Outlaws were so broke that they folded at the end of the season and they qualified for the playoffs. As in, they didn't have enough money to operate during the playoff run and folded. Okay, Let's get off this historical detour and back to the narrated action. Sabercats would have possession to start overtime. First play out the gate, Greeb would throw a long bomb to James Hunden for 44 yards. It was the Bobcats' turn to answer back, which they did in about two minutes when Fogey threw a 25-yard pass to Holmes. The last play of the game was that edge-of-your-seat college thriller with a huge decision. I like the stones Fogey showed. The paid crowd of almost 14,000 were on their feet and loud. This was in the days before the cowbells began ringing in 2003. Even I yelled, Come on, Fogey! Go for two! I dare ya! So the Bobcats went for two. Fogey's pass sailed past the end zone and into the crowd. I think this was one of those games where my voice was completely blown out after it was over. The Sabercats would finish the season 10-4, and win another Western Division, and have another great season end early with another loss to the Nashville Cats in the semifinals. The Florida Bobcats finished at 6-8, and missed the playoffs, and because of poor play and very low attendance over the years, the team folded after the 2001 season. If I found out my niche league team can't draw more than 2,500 fans was mediocre and bleeding me financially, I'd fold the team too. They weren't the only team to fade away. The Oklahoma Wranglers folded after two seasons in Oklahoma City. The Milwaukee Mustangs also folded along with the Houston Thunder Bears. The Nashville Cats didn't fold but would relocate to Atlanta. That was the nature of the Arena Football League. Here for a while, gone later. This was the largest crowd the Florida Bobcats played in front of, and I was there on June 30th, 2001.